Okay, well, welcome everybody to today's session on sustainable investing from fringe to mainstream. Um, and today's session will be run by Jason Todd. So welcome, Jason Todd. Thank you. Um, look, um, in today's session, it's a really great topic that um, Jason will be um, diving into and um, very much around the whole environmental, social and government's perspective when it comes to sustainable investing. And um, insofar as the topic, there's so much that can be explored and it can be quite technical and quite in depth. And um, what I believe Jason will do with us today is give us a good understanding of exactly what ESG investing is and some of the considerations we should take into account when making such decisions and or working with such clients in our realms who are considering making such decisions. But before we get a, go ahead, I'd just like to just thank the team at Macquarie for their great support of BGL for over 20 years. So I've been involved with BGL for a little while and um, Macquarie's been alongside us pretty much the whole time from their exceptional data feeds to their technology that we've adopted through the software. It's made an incredible difference to our clients' lives and their backing of BGO RegTech over a number of years and sponsoring so many of our events. It's something that we're forever grateful for. So to Jason and the team, Thank you. You are a quarterly organization. I am a client of yours and I love using your products. And um, I can't, you know, personally, from my experience, my experience with Macquarie has always been outstanding. So thank you for everything you do and everything you bring to the market. Um, in so far as the session, feel free to ask questions during the session. Um, if they are, um, if, if I can jump in and ask those questions of Jason, I will. If not, we'll um, go through and have the questions answered at the end. So the presentation will go for around about 35 to 40 minutes and we'll have adequate time for questions if you wanna go through those. And um, if I, I feel that we, they can be answered as part of the presentation, then obviously I'll jump in and ask the question of Jason as we go forward. So Jason, welcome. Thank you for being a part of today. And um, I really look forward to your presentation and that which you're going to be presenting to us. And um, thank you. And, and thank you, Daniel and, and Skylar, for uh, for having uh, me today. Uh, so firstly, everyone, just be aware that uh, the slides are available for you uh, after the presentation. So if there are, is anything on there which you can't make out because it's too small or, or I skip over it, please uh, sort of really, uh, understand that uh, you, you have access to this. And, and, and again, if there's anything that you might want to follow up with me directly, I'm, I'm always happy to, to, uh, to, to do that if we don't get time today. So uh, as Daniel had said, I, I want to speak for maybe 30, 35 minutes, uh, and, the, and then I'm very happy to take questions. And as he uh, also mentioned in the introduction, this is a very, um, uh, I would say, sort of um, complicated uh, topic, and it's growing so quickly that uh, everyone comes at it from very different angles. So what I want to do here is break this presentation up into just five sections. And I want to really just uh, explain what it is when we're thinking about ESG, what's driving the growth of it. Uh, thirdly, what is the end game here? What do we expect to see uh, sometime in the future when we're, when we're thinking uh, and discussing and investing on this basis? Then I want to focus more specifically uh, in sections four and five of this presentation in terms of what we would do specifically to go about making investments, either at a direct level or at a portfolio level. And then I wanna just go through some of the thematics that we're thinking about at Macquarie in terms of what supports our sustainable investment theme, uh, thematics. And, and, and I really wanna start by, by just saying that, um, and the title of this is uh, From Fringe to Mainstream, because really over the last two years, it, it really has shifted from, from something that, that was really just uh, sort of at the edge of people's investment uh, spheres to, to something now which is absolutely sort of ingrained into uh, what a lot of people are thinking about. And, uh, and I want to really sort of explain how that, is, how, to, how that has changed and why uh, um, you should not really uh, um, sort of let uh, sort of just average uh, sort of outcomes, uh, because in fact, it's very difficult to get perfect outcomes uh, in sustainable investing, uh, prevent you from trying to move down this path. And I would say this is that, uh, you know, I started my career uh, in 1996 with JP Morgan and, and, uh, and, and, uh, and, and there hasn't really been sort of, you know, too many big thematics that have gone right through that period. And if we're thinking about where we are now in terms of the growth of sustainable investing, uh, this, is a, this is something which is just only going to grow. 
grow uh, over the next sort of, I think, you know, decade. Uh, and where it will uh, sort of where it will end is that we won't so much talk about it as something uh, that uh, we're, we're investing for or investing on or trying to incorporate in investment strategies. It will just be embedded in our investment decision-making processes. Uh, and we're not there yet, uh, but that is to come. So just to start, uh, what I want to say here is this, is uh, is that uh, it's a quote uh, from, from uh, so the World Bank, uh, and it's a, it's a couple of years old, but it really does, I think, encapsulate how we feel about the sustainable investment thematic. And, and it's, it is that at the end of the day, it's the investor's decision as to what standards they expect. As someone who actually looks at this from uh, an, an, a, the perspective of writing product and creating product and uh, creating investment uh, outcomes for clients, uh, my job, and I see my job, is really to be able to provide people with, uh, and with education uh, and, and actually understanding uh, what this actually is. It's not for me to draw the line in terms of what I think is good and bad. And really, I think that you have to come at it from that perspective. If you're a client, you need to decide where your compass is, where your moral and social compass is, and you set your investment uh, outcomes uh, at that. And, uh, and, and, and effectively, when, once you set that moral compass or you have your, your, your settings aligned, along your uh, ESG spectrum, you can then decide where you want to be from an investment perspective. But there's a number of steps that I'll go through uh, in terms of actually uh, trying to get you to, to, the, to, to that end game. But keep this in mind because it's really important because uh, you know, we even in internally have a lot of debates around uh, what I feel is, is right or what someone else feels is right. And, and at the end of the day, uh, it, we will never get a consensus in terms of, uh, of what I think is right for the environment versus what you think for, is right for the environment or what I think is right for social change versus what you think is right for social change. So understanding uh, how these things are actually incorporated into the investment process uh, is probably the key part of, uh, of, of, of being able to actually uh, satisfy your sustainable investment goals. So... Let's start uh, just right at the beginning and, and really what is sustainable investing. And for some, I, I apologize if we really are going back to, 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 to basics, but um, bear with me as we kind of uh, follow this transition through this presentation and get to the end. So what is sustainable investing? Uh, really, uh, ESG, as we said, is not something on the periphery anymore. It has moved from fringe to mainstream. But basically what it really is, is, is incorporating environmental, social and governance criteria into the traditional uh, financial investment analysis. So uh, whereas previously uh, we were not consider, or, or I shouldn't say we, where previously uh, there were, the majority did not consider these types of uh, criteria within their investment decision-making process, now uh, for the most part, it sits alongside what would have traditionally been just your financial analysis uh, criteria when we're making uh, investment decisions. I don't need to go uh, into sort of what environmental or social governance factors actually are. I think you all know uh, what that uh, delineation is. But what is really important here is to understand just how quickly now it is moving into the mainstream from an investment perspective. And according to the World uh, Economic Forum in their last sort of review, two of the three leading trends that they think create both risks and opportunities for investors are ESG related. And that is environmental change, which everyone is very familiar with. It's inequality uh, and it's cybersecurity. Now, there's a long list of factors which come under there. And in fact, there's a number of other environmental and social governance factors there. But it's pretty interesting that uh, now we, we, we really think that uh, some of the key risks and opportunities for investors are very much related to, to the ESG world. Uh, and I don't think that they're going to lessen in terms of their importance. They're only going to become more important. So if we, if we know sort of what, what, what this actually means, what is actually driving this growth now, because it's important to understand how this is actually transitioning into the mainstream from an investment perspective. Uh, and what I really wanted to just indicate or give you an indication of as before we even got too far into this is that the ESG side of things is not new. Uh, in fact, it's been around for, for a, a long time, and that's why we were talking about it become, being fringe and becoming mainstream. And a very good way to think about this is uh, on this slide here, we, we just set out when you had the first World Climate Conference, which was actually over 40 years ago. Uh, and that was followed 20 years later by the Kyoto Protocol, uh, which was, again, uh, from a climate perspective. And then another 20 years later, uh, we had the Paris Accord. Uh, and even though we had the Paris Accord, uh, and, and that was now only sort of five or six years ago, it has really 
really only taken shape uh, in the last uh, few years where we've had the commitments uh, from governments uh, to, 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 uh, to, to climate control. And, and so it has been a very, very long, slow sort of burn to actually uh, get these sorts of things uh, into the mainstream. Uh, but now they are in, in, in mainstream. We want to, I'd like to sort of run through uh, how that has actually just happened before we get into the investment side of things. So when we think about what has driven this over the last few years, um, you know, there's a number of things that, that are supporting it. And, it's, and I think it's important to understand why attitudes have actually changed to, 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 uh, to, to also help you allow, or also to sort of give you a greater understanding of why it's unlikely to change and why it's actually likely, we think, to actually just continue to grow in importance. Uh, and there are a number of things, and, and look, I don't have... Uh, the all uh, encompassing list in terms of, of what, is, what, what is driving this. But there are a few things which really sit as very important for um, moving these fringe uh, concepts into the mainstream. And the first one we, we, we really think is just that there is now a, a much greater consensus view by governments and policymakers uh, that they need to start to address some of these issues. Uh, we've been through what some may consider to be a climate uh, crisis over the last few years. And that has also sort of uh, refocused governments into actually trying to, to, uh, to, to um, put regulations and drive incentives uh, for change there. Uh, from, an from a regulatory perspective, you've, you've had the UNPRI, which is the Principles for, for Responsible Investing, which is probably one of the key guides now uh, from a regulatory perspective for a lot of firms, a lot of asset managers, a lot of fund managers, etc., to, to, to begin to follow. The third thing which we feel is really driving this now uh, and, and, uh, and, and goes to the presentation today is that there is now just a better understanding. There's now a better education. Uh, consumers and households uh, are now much more aware of what's going on uh, in terms of their decisions and the external uh, and sorry the externalities of those decisions. Um, the last few, uh, which I think are really important for, for thinking about what's going on here, and, and it's important from an understanding perspective, is the first one is that there is uh, increased evidence now that uh, from an investment perspective to focus on sustainability or ESG uh, criteria, you do not have to uh, sacrifice returns. There's been a view out there for quite some time that uh, trying to uh, have uh, incorporate environmental and social and governance factors into your investment decision making meant that you had to sacrifice returns either at a single investment perspective or at a portfolio level. The data and the evidence does not show that at all and in fact it actually shows that incorporating this now can enhance your returns over a longer term perspective. The other two things which I think is really important here is that uh, it was really thought of as the domain of, uh, of either governments or, 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 or to some extent the private sector to actually uh, bear the burdens of bear the burden of these types of costs that might be involved in terms of uh, becoming cleaner or greener or implementing sort of social change, whether it be uh, equality or, or, or those types of things. It's now uh, uh, largely believed that the costs of environmental and social governance change are being borne by everyone. There's almost a socialization of, of the cost base uh, right across the spectrum. So uh, consumers are feeling it. Uh, it might be slightly higher prices in some areas. Businesses are feeling it, uh, whereby if they don't adopt, uh, they, they face a higher cost of capitals. Uh, governments are feeling it in terms of the pressure uh, and, uh, for, 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 their, for, for their political sort of sustainability. Uh, so so it's right, and, and, and investors are actually feeling it, uh, and asset managers are feeling it because if they're not following this, you're not allocating them funds, their cost of capital, sorry, their, their valuations, et cetera, are going down. So there's a, there, there's a real sort of socialization of that cost burden. And the last thing that I'll say is the real proliferation of products. And this is where I just want to highlight this chart, and, 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 and I won't sort of highlight too many charts through, throughout this presentation. But if you go back to sort of the early days of when we were thinking about ESG, uh, most of the growth was in new funds. It was not in repurposed old funds. But now what, what we're finding is that uh, in, in 2021, it wasn't quite 50%, but it's getting up to sort of, uh, you know, an even split in terms of those funds which are re-established new, which have an ESG overlay, and those which are uh, existing funds which have now started to incorporate an ESG overlay, as you can see uh, sort of from the right-hand column in, in that chart. So there has just been a, a, an acceptance uh, also from an asset management perspective that this is where the demand is from a client uh, perspective. Um, the last thing that, that, that I'll sort of say here is, 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 um, is, is there, COVID in the last uh, two years 
has been a huge accelerator of, uh, of ESG into mainstream from an investment perspective. And there's a timeline that, that, that we've had to go through from, from this perspective and the evolution of ESG, uh, as I said, sort of from an environmental perspective, this has been talked about for, for decades, but really from an investment perspective, it's happened post uh, the GFC. So uh, uh, after the GFC, there was a huge focus on governance. Uh, and that was where uh, you saw a, a lot of re regulation come back in to sort of uh, uh, ensure that uh, corporates, in particular the financial services sector, uh, were behaving as they needed to. The rise of, of environmental has been a slow burn, as I have mentioned, but again, sort of because of, of uh, concerns around the climate crisis, whether it be bushfires, rising sea levels, uh, those types of things, it certainly has uh, picked up and intensified in the last decade. Uh, and social uh, has very much, uh, which was the lagging factor within this invest uh, within the investment criteria here has uh, just exploded uh, post the COVID environment. And that really has been because uh, this health crisis has forced corporates, businesses, governments, uh, and investors and consumers uh, to focus on health and well-being. Uh, and it was, it, you know, it's a shame we would say that it took a global pandemic to make people uh, and businesses and governments more aware of, of social issues uh, and, and how they fit into uh, sort of, you know, the, the sustainability of firms and those types of things. Um, but, it is, but it is ultimately uh, what it is. And the last point I'll say before, before I move on here is uh, perhaps one of the most, I feel, uh, underestimated uh, shifts in terms of uh, corporate uh, 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 change actually happened pre-COVID in uh, August 2019, uh, where the US Business uh, Commission, um, which is which is essentially sort of oversees all US businesses, they came out and changed uh, the emission statement uh, from a share a stakeholder value, to, uh, sorry, from shareholder value to stakeholder value. So uh, in 2019, uh, most US corporates uh, signed that and they effectively has said that we're shifting away from just a focus on uh, adding value for shareholders. And we're now focused equally on uh, our customers, our suppliers, our stakeholders and our investors. Uh, and I think that this has to some extent uh, been largely glossed over, um, but it is an incredibly important development from a corporate and business perspective I feel for being able to, to ultimately uh, um, uh, continue to support uh, this ESG, uh, the growth of ESG. Um, and uh, the, the last sort of two, two slides in this, in, in this section gives you an idea of, uh, of just how things have actually changed. And, uh, and, and this slide here is, is showing you uh, the, the growth in, uh, in funds and where they've actually come from. Uh, and in, two, uh, in, in 2020, uh, the top seven areas uh, in terms of the development of funds that have come through were all environmental. Uh, probably no surprise given what's going on. The next six were all social. And then the next sort of five to six were a mix of government, of governance and, and, uh, and social factors. So uh, there, is, there, there is a reaction by those who are actually developing the investment uh, side of things uh, to the changing demand. And, and, and while we might go through ebbs and flows in terms of, of uh, what thematics and what's important from uh, an investment perspective or from a personal perspective or what the government is focused on, um, this is, is only really going to change the growth rate, uh, the trajectory for these, uh, for these types of uh, investments and incorporating them into your uh, portfolios is on a one-way track, we think, and, and that's up. So uh, really to, to, to kind of just summarize uh, where we are, we, we've, uh, we've discussed sort of what, we, uh, what, what ESG is, what's driving the growth. And I wanna just make a quick comment before I move on in, in terms of uh, what, what, what is the end game here and, and what should we be really uh, be focused on? And what I will, want, uh, will, will say here is that um, ultimately uh, some of the things that we have been very focused on uh, from a corporate perspective uh, in terms of the social change uh, and, and, and also in terms of uh, the environmental changes as well, uh, they're structural. Um, but they can sort of shift in terms of the real focuses uh, of, of either um, uh, households or, or businesses or, or governments. And, and some of it, we don't quite know uh, how will, it will change over the coming years. So for example, there has been a big shift to try and actually uh, you know, um, pay for your talent uh, from a business perspective or to raise non-financial um, uh, incentives for, for your workers or to be able to give our workers hybrid models. 
And uh, when profitability uh, begins to uh, come under threat, we don't quite know yet uh, how that might change the thrust of these types of things. Um, and, and so really uh, what we're saying here is, is that uh, things can change at the margin in terms of where the focus is, um, but attitudes towards incorporating this into an investment perspective will not. And, uh, and, and, and when we think about the end game for, uh, for sustainable investing, um, we think that it really will just become a situation where there is a balance between short and long-term objectives and it goes across all E, S, and G areas. And, and that might sound sort of quite uh, a grandiose statement, but really what we're saying here is, is that when we break it down into household investments, businesses and government sort of implications here, it is, for example, a situation where a consumer, a consumer's consumption choices are relatively seamless, where they can actually sort of choose uh, to move down a sustainable path uh, and any sustainable path that they want without having to really sacrifice uh, their, their choice. From an investment perspective, uh, you have as much choice as you need uh, to get exposure to uh, various themes or it's fully incorporated into uh, the investment landscape uh, from a fund management perspective or a business perspective or those types of things. So that is really ultimately where we think it's going. It will certainly take time to, to, to ultimately get there and, and I think that you're going to have uh, lots of winners and losers and lots of sort of uh, periods of time where you know, there, there will be frustration at, at what might be slow moving uh, sort of developments in certain areas. Um, but ultimately, from an investment perspective, we're very comfortable that um, it's going to be incorporated into the process uh, and you won't even discuss it uh, like we do currently. The last thing before I move into how, how we actually really want to incorporate this into your investment process is it's really important uh, to, to not be uh, to not become overly focused just on one type of, of thematic that might uh, exist within the sustainable investment sphere. And what I wanted to show in this in, in this slide is really that uh, sustainable investing and what we talk about when we when we think ESG can encounter or encapsulate many different things. And everyone is focused now on uh, net zero. Uh, net zero isn't the only thing. Uh, and, and the reason why I started this, this slide pack by, by saying that you set your own compass in terms of what you think is important uh, is because just uh, is, is that just because uh, you know uh, governments or businesses or everyone is focused on uh, on on net zero and, and climate uh, outcomes doesn't mean that uh, it's more important uh, from an investment perspective at least um, as anything else that might be uh, important to you you see uh, where you want to to be on that uh, on that on that on that um, on that sustainability spectrum uh, and no one else and that's why uh, when we look at it from an investment perspective, uh, we're not trying to draw lines in the sand in terms of where we think people should, should should actually be. It's for us to provide you with the information and you to decide where you want to sit on that spectrum. So the last two things that that, that I really want to, want to get onto is, is how do we actually uh, make investment decisions within the sustainability space? And uh, and then what are we focused on from a thematic perspective? And I break this, uh, this, this section down uh, into four areas here, and I'm going to go through each of them. And uh, and really, this should give you a, a clear idea of how you get from the start to the finish when you're when you're thinking about uh, the investment side of things. So we think about it from a client evaluation perspective, and I'll go into these in a little bit more detail. Then uh, the investment universe then how we might select funds across that universe, and then what the implications are from a portfolio perspective. And again, it's really important to understand here is, is that um, you are going to have to make sacrifices ultimately uh, to get what you want in this space. It is very difficult to actually be able to implement uh, your social, uh, environmental, social, and governance uh, um, uh, objectives evenly across all investments at this stage. Uh, and so there's going to have to be a, a discussion uh, that you might have uh, or you might have with your client or your client might have with you about what you're prepared to actually sacrifice uh, in terms of actually trying to get to your objectives and, and we'll go through that. Um, but the first step for us here uh, in any uh, decision from a sustainability perspective is just to decide where you sit on the, on the ESG spectrum. 
Now we can sit uh, at the very left-hand side of, uh, of, of the traditional investment sphere, which is just uh, effectively just um, shareholder value, uh, firms which are focused on shareholder value, just pure profit. You're not worried about the social, uh, environmental and governance uh, implications, or you can be on the other end of the spectrum, which is really impact investing in uh, philanthropy, uh, which is really just pure social. So in between those two uh, anchor points, pure, pure profit and pure social, uh, is where most people are, where everyone's basically going to sit. Now, again, there's no right or wrong here. Uh, it's simply up to where uh, people decide they want to be. Um, but what we, we really have to sort of understand here is that uh, as we move from uh, left to right here, from profit to, to social, we start to reduce the, 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 um, the focus on financial outcomes and we start to increase the focus on uh, social or, or environmental or governance outcomes. And that's really uh, the defining factor of how we move across here. And what you have to do when you start is you have to decide where you wanna be uh, because that will decide uh, as, as we move through here, um, ultimately uh, the type of investments and the type of, uh, of, of screenings that, that we might want to actually uh, incorporate into uh, that investment selection process. Um, the other way of, of thinking about this if, uh, from, from uh, an ESG spectrum perspective is to just say, uh, am I focused on shareholder value? Am I focused on stakeholder value? Or am I focused on impact? And where do I want to be across here? Shareholder value, pure profit. Stakeholder, uh, stakeholder value is, uh, as we mentioned, it's a balance between uh, um, the factors which might be uh, your customers, suppliers, uh, the, your, your owners and the business. And then impact focus is when you actually want to uh, enact an outcome and your financial, uh, uh, financial sort of rewards are not uh, a pure sort of, uh, sorry, the first outcome that you're trying to actually uh, balance off. So once you've actually uh, decided uh, on uh, where you are on your spectrum, um, you have to then start to uh, work out what you're prepared to sacrifice to get there. And uh, it's unfortunate that, we, uh, that we, we, we have this step in here because in a pure world, uh, in the Nirvana world, um, when, when, when there are enough investment choices and they're perfectly incorporated into uh, these investments across all assets, we wouldn't have to have this step. But at this stage, uh, we do. Uh, and really, it's simply uh, just because there's imperfect ability to implement uh, your ESG preferences across assets and at a portfolio level consistently. So what are some of the issues that we have to deal with here? Um, the first thing that we have to deal with when you're discussing this uh, from, a, from a client or, or an investment perspective is what is your time frame? Uh, and, uh, and, and you can sit on your investment spectrum and then say, well, if I've got a short time frame, then that becomes quite difficult because generally impact investing uh, is a, has a long time frame, or trying to get social, environmental, and government outcomes are, are really just longer term dated sort of uh, things that we, we're very focused on. So there's a time frame issue here. Do am I am I tactically asset allocating or am I strategically asset allocating? I need to work out um, that. Secondly, is that some assets uh, don't incorporate or have very uh, low incorporation of ESG factors. Um, so it's started with equities. So equities are predominantly the asset class that has a lot of integration and impact ESG factors incorporated into them. But once you start going into fixed income, alternatives, real assets, they start to drop off. And I've got a slide there that will show you. So you need to understand as a second point that there are some assets that you're going to have to understand that you might not be able to get your, your objectives from an ESG perspective. Uh, the third thing which is really important to understand is, um, is that some, invest, some investments that you might like can be green, but the issuing firm might not be green itself. And, and this is what comes up when we get a lot of green bonds, for example, is just that the bond is there to, uh, to, to support uh, or to finance a green project. But the issuer of the bond might not be green. Are you comfortable with that? So there's there, there is that type of thing uh, that, that you need to also be uh, considered need to consider. And the last thing, and there's a lot of uh, of others, but we think that these are probably the key things that that you need to consider as you work down this list is that uh, there are very big regional differences in terms of how things are incorporated across assets. So Europe was, was very much the leader in terms of uh, incorporating these types of, of, uh, of factors into um, their investment decision-making. Uh, the US has now caught up. Asia has been... Uh, 
I would say, a lagging in that. And then sort of the rest of emerging markets, uh, you know, there are major issues in, in terms of, of, of sort of, you know, the incorporation uh, into even the biggest asset class, which is equities. So my point here is this, is that the first step, uh, deciding where you are on the spectrum, that's pretty easy for most people. Uh, the second step is uh, uh, understand what you uh, might not be able to get uh, to actually incorporate those objectives into your portfolio. Am I prepared to actually own some assets that don't have ESG? Am I prepared to own some investments that, are, that support a green project, but are not issued by a green a firm? Uh, am I prepared to actually own some assets in an area, i.e. region or country, uh, that might not have as, uh, as, as tight ESG principles from an investment perspective as in other areas? So if I bought European equities, am I still comfortable buying uh, Asian equities? So when you, when you have an idea about this, and it sounds complicated, but in fact, you just have to understand uh, some of the basic differences and then be comfortable with them. You can move uh, to, to, to essentially to, to the next step. But I would say, that that um, the overriding one that 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 I want to to almost leave you with when you think about um, what I have to give up is the time frame issue. Is don't think that you can actually uh, uh, sort of um, you know be an impact investor or or be right on the end of the social spe investment spectrum, uh, but have short term uh, return or or or, or, uh, or, or social and, and governance and environmental objectives. It's wholly inconsistent. It won't work. Uh, and so the further you get along. Uh, the environment, sorry, the the the, uh, the the ESG spectrum. The longer uh, you have to actually uh, be prepared to to invest your money for to get those types of outcomes. Um, so the second uh, part of, of of that that step is then. So you've got where do you want to be on the spectrum? What are you prepared to give up from a client perspective, from an investment perspective? And then how do you actually do this? And and it's pretty simple here. There's three types of ways that we can do this. It's direct investment. So whether it's direct equities or it might be sort of, you know, physical assets or those types of things, you can do it at a fund level or you can do it at a portfolio level where you're effectively buying. Uh, it might be a, 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 a sort of, you know, an SMA or something like that, which is set up with to, to actually um, uh, sort of incorporate those ESG principles. Every one of them has their advantages and disadvantages. You can read the slide. You don't really need me to, 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 to go over these um, things. Um, but I, I guess from, an, uh, from your perspective as an individual thinking about this, you know, the easiest way to control your outcomes is, is via your own direct investments. Um, and, uh, and, and then as soon as you start to get into a fund or a portfolio level, you're basically um, uh, taking on um, the, the process that a fund manager or, or, or an asset manager is effectively going to be using. And if you're comfortable with that, that's perfectly fine. And, 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 and for the most part, people don't have the ability to actually uh, look into a lot of the ESG type um, things that, that might actually come up. So, so, so you really are, are only going to start at that second and, and all that, that third level. Um, but again, um, just sort of understand that um, you know, there are going to be uh, inconsistencies at all levels here. So for example, there's no consistency in terms of how fund managers might actually implement um, ESG into their process. And, and I'll talk about that as, as we go on. So that's the third part of, 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 those, um, of those first two steps. So, so the third thing here is this. So you've, you, you've decided where you wanna sit uh, in terms of your objectives. Um, you've decided uh, what you are prepared to sort of uh, maybe sacrifice to get them. Uh, and then uh, what do you, how do you want uh, these things to be implemented when you choose your investments in the end? Um, and again, there's another uh, uh, sort of three choices here in terms of how it gets done. Uh, there's exclusion, there's integration, and then there's impact. Uh, and this is really how uh, fund managers have, uh, have, have, have uh, tried to incorporate these ESG criteria into their investment decision-making process. And initially, it was exclusion, which was just negative screening. That was the most basic way of doing this. All we did was, or I shouldn't say we, all they did was they took a screen and they said, we're not going to invest in tobacco, uh, firearms, uh, fossil fuels, uh, those types of things. Uh, it's now moved on from that. That, we would say, is a very basic starting point. The majority of, uh, of, uh, of, of, uh, of fund managers now are, are really integrating uh, ESG factors into their process. So integration is the second way. So you can get uh, investments where they're just screening negatively uh, out. So they're not actually uh, focused on, uh, on, on, on the positive factors 
um, that a company might actually be trying to implement. Integration is where you take these uh, ESG uh, factors and you uh, incorporate them into the investment decision in terms of actually uh, trying to find uh, good or bad companies. And the last one is, is, is largely impact is, is, is essentially where you are just choosing companies here outside of the financial spectrum where you where there is a, a social or, 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 uh, or environmental objective. And again, how it gets implemented into the investment process will vary by the fund manager. Uh, and you need to decide uh, at what level you want this actually sort of um, uh, put into practice. And uh, the next slide will show you why this is really important. So the last step in terms of, uh, of how this goes through the investment process, here we've got, and this is the fourth and last step, how does it get incorporated into the actual investment that you put in a portfolio? Here we've uh, separated uh, the different types of investments out by uh, screening, negative screening, integration, and, uh, and, and effectively sustainable or impact. As you can see, um, uh, there are very few assets where um, the focus really is on impact. Uh, and as you go sort of back towards the most simplest way of, of, of looking at these things, which is negative screening, you have a lot more. So uh, essentially, uh, what you again uh, sort of have to sort of consider here is at what level do you want your objectives uh, being incorporated into the investment process? Because it, it is easy to choose, right? You can have a developed equity fund manager who just negatively screens. You can have a developed equity manager who incorporates, uh, integrates ESG factors into their investment process, or you can just choose an impact fund. So, so there are levels there. But once you, for example, uh, start getting down to uh, uh, what might be commodities, um, well, there is very little integration going on and there's very little positive impact going on either. Um, and, and so that's the type of thing that you need to, to ultimately decide on. Um, and, uh, and, and, and really, it, it almost sounds like it's quite a convoluted, uh, difficult sort of process here. But, but all I say is this, is you don't need to go through every decision at every step. You just have to need, you, you just need to understand that there are different ways of actually thinking about this. Uh, and, uh, and, and I guess what, what you're really focused on here is where the big inconsistencies might actually lie when you're thinking about it from a practical perspective. So for example, if I'm really focused, if I'm really uh, socially aware of and environmentally aware and I am an impact investor, I just have to understand that it's going to be difficult to set up my entire portfolio in that way, but I can be comfortable that there are going to be some assets, key assets that I can do in, in that way. Uh, and a, a few other things, um, and I apologize for, for going for, for taking way too long here, I, I will speed up. There's only a, a couple more that I want to go through here is um, the last thing I want to say is again, this is really just a knowledge part of understanding what we're trying to, what, what you're trying to do here, uh, and being aware of, of of some of the things that could catch you out. And so, some of the challenges uh, in the ESG investment process, th th there are lots of things that that people need to be aware of. But just uh, just for simplicity, we've got five here which we feel are, are very important for you to just. Uh, understand are going to be things that you really do need to consider. The first one is that don't assume uh, that there's consistency in terms of, uh, of information that comes out around, uh, around ESG, which means the data disclosures, uh, the ratings firms uh, all, all, all look at different things, all of those types of things. So uh, it, it, it's very difficult to get consistency, whether it's even in the same market, whether it's by the ratings operators, whether it's be across countries or whether it be across regions. So understand that part of it. Uh, the second thing is, is that um, uh, there is very big differences in materiality. So what this really means is what I think is important might be what might not be what you think is important. But if we're taking um, a, a fund manager or a rating agency, they determine what they feel is important. So you need to understand how they rank the factors that they think are important. So do I put environment first? Do I put social first? Do I put governance first? Those types of things. Um, again, the various uh, levels of integration, we don't need to go on, on, on in that. But the, the, the fourth one is very important, which is concentration risk. So understand this is that if you don't want to buy fossil fuels, uh, let's just say in, in Australia, uh, commodities are 20%. So I take that part of it out of, of your investment universe. So your investment universe is only 80% of the market. So you have concentration risk now because you're, you've taken a big part of the market out. So you have to own more of the rest of it. And that can change your risk reward for, for your portfolios as well. Uh, and the last thing is just the timeframe, uh, which you're well aware of. Um, and so 
I want to make one more, more, more comment here in terms of, of some of the things that you have to also consider from an investment perspective before we talk about um, the themes, and that's ratings. Uh, and, uh, and, and, and whether you are looking at it in terms of how some of these rating agencies uh, might rate the uh, fund managers themselves or the products, or uh, the ratings that might be used um, to give you an indication of the ESG-ness of an individual in, uh, in investment. Um, all you need to understand here is that there is no consistency across ratings. Uh, and that is uh, that doesn't make it good or bad. That just means that uh, there are a number of things that uh, determine why uh, there are differences. And if you can see this chart here, which is a pretty interesting way of, of, of looking at it, is there's different stocks down the left-hand side, and there's five different ESG rating uh, firms uh, which and their ratings. As you can see, they're not clustered for any stocks. They're all over the place. Um, and if you were to, for example, get a credit rating for a company, so whether you went to Moody's or whether you went to uh, uh, Finch, Fitch, uh, they would generally be very, very tightly correlated because they look at the same things. The reason why there's no consistency in the ratings process uh, is because every uh, a ratings agency has a different view on materiality, what they think is important might be different to what the next one is important. Secondly, they all like to have their own proprietary model, which they don't tell you uh, in terms of, of how it's developed, which means that it gives them a unique uh, view of, of, of the rating side. And then the third thing is, is that uh, there are a lot of issues around data and filling it in and getting consistent data from, 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 from different companies. And how do they fill that data in is also a difference. So when you understand this, it doesn't mean that, for example, uh, you know, rating one person is better than rating five. Uh, you, you just need to understand how they do their ratings process. And often uh, for institutional managers, uh, the ESG rating is, is just a starting point for them. They might look at it and then they might go into uh, certain detail and, and, and they can pull it apart in that way. Clearly, uh, that's not going to be possible for everyone to do uh, individually. Um, but, but, but again, I think that uh, what you need to do is, is, to, is, for example, to understand just what the rating is is actually telling you. And, and I'll tell you a very simple uh, sort of way to think about this is uh, MSCI, for example, um, rates the impact of the environment on a company. Uh, and uh, Morningstar rates the impact of the company on the environment. So they're completely switched over. Neither is better than the other. It's just whatever you think uh, is, is, is more important for you from an investment perspective. Um, and the last thing I'll say is this, and, and uh, which which we ultimately have to watch out for is is this sort of you know this greenwashing which is going on now, where you've got firms uh, uh, talking about investments which are green, which really aren't green. Uh, it's very difficult to actually uh, uh, pick up uh, from 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 the perspective of of uh, investors, uh, and particularly at an individual level. Um, obviously, sort of you know professional fund managers are quite aware of this. Um, but there are always going to be sort of issues that are going to come up here. There is no silver bullet. There is no consistency. Uh, every sort of uh, um, uh, ratings firm will do it differently. Uh, and, and as long as you understand that um, and, and, and you're comfortable with your investment, uh, sort of how you've actually uh, translated your objectives into your actual outcomes, um, you know, we just have to live with a process that's imperfect. Uh, and lastly, uh, and, and I'm going to just sort of brush over this because, in fact, I think that the, the, the thematics on, on how we're doing things is probably more important for you to actually look at the presentation yourself. But what we're doing, what, what, the way that we do it here at, at Macquarie is this, is that we, we tend to, to, uh, to, to think about a, a core investment holdings from a sustainability perspective. So that might be funds uh, which are sustainable within Australian equities, within global equities, uh, within fixed income. Uh, there's not a lot of real assets. So in fact, uh, we uh, reduce our real assets, uh, sorry, our alternatives exposure, and we raise our growth assets exposure, which is equities. But a lot of people might just say that I don't need to um, uh, ESG proof my portfolio. How can I actually get some exposure into uh, some of these structural ESG thematics? And so what we've done here is we have our core, which is our traditional fund managers, and we have a portfolio for how we think about it. But then we've identified some key themes that we think are structural and which you can get uh, very uh, good exposure to uh, on a structural, uh, at a structural level. Uh, we would not recommend that anyone would add uh, this 
um, uh, uh, sorry, their satellite holdings into a portfolio at any more than probably 10, maximum 15%, because these are, they, these are non-core, they sit with your portfolio. So for example, you don't want 50% of your portfolio just in green transport or decarbonisation, uh, but you might have you know, 5% in, uh, of, of your holding in green transport or, or, uh, or, or decarbonisation. That it's that type of, um, of, of allocations. Um, so for us, there's 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 four themes that we that we uh, feel are, are important, and there's a lot of themes, and and this is why we we really feel that you have to kind of narrow down where you want to be focused, otherwise you're going to be pulled in all directions. We think the overriding anchor themes that are going to be very very dominant over the next ten to twenty years are clearly decarbonisation, which is the topic du jour. Uh, it's resource efficiency. Um, which is how efficiently you use resources, which is basically a productivity type thing. We're, we're getting more output with less resources. It's the circular economy, which is recycling, uh, which is very, very sort of uh, big. Uh, and then it's green transport. Uh, and so these uh, four things we feel, uh, you don't have to own all of them, um, but if you're trying to sort of narrow these down, uh, uh, we, we do feel that, uh, that that they're going to have uh, longevity. Uh, and all I'll say is this, and, and, and I'm going to stop because because I'm, I'm going to I, I, I always tend to talk too long. Um, but but but, we, but there are ways to invest in each of them, and and that's why we we, we sort of have them as our as our anchor themes. Um, so uh, you know wh whether it's uh, in, in decarbonisation, you know whether you you've got green winners, which are, are certain types of commodities. Uh, it can be certain types of energy production, and it can be certain types of uh, te technology. So whether it's buying sort of EV uh, uh, producers or those types of things. So within decarbonisation, we all know the theme, uh, but but there are ways to play this um, which cut across uh, many different sort of areas. Um, within resource efficiency, which which again sort of you know I've said that it, it's it's effectively using your resources uh, more efficiently. Uh, there are also ways uh, to think about this. You, there, there are you can get into robotics or, or AI, which which is which is the technology part of resource efficiency. You can be in agriculture, uh, which is uh, largely leveraged into actually improving yields on on uh, on land. Or uh, there's also water-based ETFs and investment thematics that that you can play. So there are a number of of, of sub themes within resource efficiency, which we feel are very very long dated. Uh, and in particular, uh, if you're not interested in technology, which is the robotics and AI, uh, we do feel that uh, sort of the water Water side and the agricultural side within our resource efficiency is something uh, that, uh, that that we would recommend exposure into. Uh, the circular economy here, which is which is basically uh, waste and recycling, uh, thinking about uh, uh, packaging, um, those types of things. Again, um, sort of. Uh, probably not as easy to play uh, at, at, a, at a more macro level, um, but there are, there is a global uh, waste ETF um, and, and from a passive perspective, and there's environmental services ETFs as well. And then lastly, uh, green transport. We all kind of know what this is, whether it's battery technology, uh, whether it's the actual commodities themselves, um, or whether it's the autonomous uh, or, or electric vehicle producers, product, uh, producers uh, or it could be actually um, the... the, the um, uh, the component parts of uh, green transport, so whether it's semiconductors or those types of things. So, so again, um, we feel that you have your anchor themes here, and then you drop down into your sub themes, and there's, there are ways to play them. Um, but we we, we do uh, uh, sort of recommend that these uh, satellite thematics are added to your core portfolio, and you can get some exposure to them. But we wouldn't recommend that uh, that that you uh, load up your portfolio uh, um, in these types of thematics as substitutes for your core holdings. Holdings. Um, so uh, that's uh, essentially sort of what I wanted to get to here, and, and I apologise if I've gone on for too long or, 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 or skip through areas um, uh, too quickly. Um, but but all I say here is this is, is that um, uh, th this is now uh, this is you know uh, ESG and sustainable investing now is is uh, is not going away. It's only going to continue to to be something that everyone needs to be uh, more informed of. And uh, and I would really recommend that people take the time to actually just get an understanding of. Of, of what it actually means and how you actually uh, need to do it. Um, and the second part of, of this is, is that there is no one size fits all. And just because uh, there is not, it, it's not perfect yet in terms of how it's implemented or that you have to make sacrifices for how you want to actually um, uh, make it or, or have your investments reflect your objectives, doesn't mean that you, you can't start down this path. Uh, and the last thing that, that I'll say is uh, don't be concerned that 
uh, some things will come in vogue or some things won't come out, you know, or, or, or they'll drop out of vogue. Um, I suspect that that's going to be the case for many different things. And, and, uh, and, uh, and, and we might not see as much focus on the climate if, uh, you know, if oil is $150, uh, because actually sort of, you know, renewable energy, um, uh, we, sorry, because the, because the incentives might change uh, quite, quite significantly. So um, uh, there are a lot of things to consider, um, but, 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 um, but it can be sort of uh, simplified uh, if you uh, really uh, sort of have an understanding of where you want to sit on the spectrum. So, Daniel, I apologise for taking so long. Uh, I'm going to stop here and, uh, <laughs> and, 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 uh, and open, take a breath and open up to questions. Well, thank you, Jason. That was um, incredible. And, um, uh, you know, it, it's going to be a key topic going forward and just exactly how, you know, people diversify their investment is going to be something that, you know, needs to be given careful consideration. And um, thank you for just making that um, just so simple and easy to understand. And um, we appreciate that because we know how complex that whole area can be. Um, if anyone has any questions, of Jason, that would be now would be a great time to ask those. And um, we have a little bit of time left. If not, um, a recording of the webinar will be made available. Um, the notes will also be made available. Um, while we ask for, you know, wait for any questions to come through, just I'll put through a link there for BGL RegTech, um, which is coming up in the next couple of weeks. We're starting off in Sydney on the 1st of March, Brisbane the 2nd. And then Adelaide the 9th and Melbourne the 16th um, will be having holding Registech uh, pretty much across the country. We'd love to see you there if you can come along. Our good friends and sponsors of Macquarie will also be there. So if you have any questions about today's presentation, I'm sure you can drop a bit of a line there, but you want to learn more about their products, I'd love to hear from you. But um, on behalf of BGL, Jason, we'd just like to say thank you for today's presentation. And once again, thank you for your continued support of, our, of us and who we are and what we do. And thank you for just providing such great quality products to our industry for such a long time. Um, thank, thank you, Daniel. Thank you, everyone, for joining. And, and just um, if the, the presentation is available, and, and we actually also have um, some more in-depth um, research product that actually just supports our uh, sustainable investing themes, and, and, and you're very welcome um, to, 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 uh, to have those and, and, and to look over them, and they will go into a little bit more detail about some of the specifics that, um, that we're, we're focused on. Fantastic. Well, thank you, everyone. No questions have come through, so we'll take it, but um, everyone's pretty, pretty good on what's being presented, and if you'd like to know more, please do reach out to the team at Macquarie. They'd be more than happy to help you.